Hi, I'm Dan Schmidt. I do a motorcycle racing TV show, Team Chicago Challenge. My email is teamdan45 at gmail.com. My website is teamchicago.tv. So we're at Walnick Swap Meet, but we're going to be celebrating. I have done 1,700 shows, but I'm going to do a part one and a part two. So I'm going to look back at what I've produced over the last two years. Because every, I do 50 shows a year at least. So let's see what happened back in the past. I'm going to put two shows together, two clips together, and I hope you enjoy what I'm uh, putting together for you. And don't forget my email, teamdan45 at gmail.com, and I'd love to hear from my audiences. I traveled to Ashland, Ohio to race this lovely half mile with my 750 Trackmaster frame Triumph. I just changed the ignition to a total loss system, solid state, instead of the magneto. So I'm testing to see how the bike accelerates, how it runs on this great half mile, how AMA has banned helmet cams. This is just practice, but then they told me I had to take that camera off my helmet. At least you get to see this lovely cushion track, Ashland, Ohio. And we're going to see one of the heat races for the All-Star Twins. I got to interview my old friend, Jared Vandecoil, and then the All-Star Twins final event. Now we're looking at the all-star twin up front. It is Jared Vandecoil. He is from Mount Galit, which is nearby, and he's riding that Indian Scout second place. Looks like Jeffrey Lowry. He's on a Kawasaki. He's from St. Louisville, Ohio. Third place, it's like number 73. That's Shane Livingston going by and really stretching the lead on that Indian Scout. That is Jared Vandecoil. But on that Indian scout, Jared Vandekool, local hero, and I haven't had a chance to talk to him since Springfield, probably in 2018. And I had a chance to look at his Indian scout and ask him about the racetrack and his sponsors. So how's the track? Tell me about the track out there. The track's good, you know, Steve May's got a lot of moisture in it. Uh, it's heavy, the cushion's pretty deep. But uh, having fun, yeah, track's good. Sponsors you want to mention? Yeah, uh, everyone that gets me here, uh, Ben for bringing the bike out. Um, if not, if you ride my personal bike. Crew Systems, Dallas, Texas, Mission Foods, HCR, with Molly, everyone that helps me out, Senna, appreciate it. Thank you, Jared. This is it, the final event. All-Star Twin jumping out front. It's Cameron Smith. He's from Waterloo, New York. He's on a Kawasaki. Second place is like Jared Vandecoil. Third place is like Jeffrey Lowry. He's on a Kawasaki. Great battle up front as we see Jared Vandecoil trying to find a way by. Cameron Smith, the New York rider on the Kawasaki, has got the point. The Indian scout trying to chase him down. Third place is Jeffrey Lowry, Shane Livingston running in fourth place. They're going on to pick up the win, it's Cameron Smith. In 2022, I ran the Illinois Motorcycle Freedom Run to Marseille, oh, Illinois. And I also got to see the Black see Tigers honor guard. Stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. Or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night. 
July of 2022, I was at the EAA Air Adventure, that's the Experimental Aircraft Association in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, as we see this flyover honoring all branches of the United States military. Then I had a chance to talk to an owner of a vintage jet, Paul Kepler. Hi, I'm Paul Kepler. I'm the owner of this Canadian-built T-33 Shooting Star, or Silver Star as the Canadians call it. Um, and from the time I was a kid, I had a deep love for aviation. I got from my father, and he actually flew these airplanes back in the day. And this airplane, uh, T stands for trainer, and it was derived from the single-seat F-80 Shooting Star fighter. And so it was the first American jet fighter. And so Lockheed and the Air Force saw a need to train these new pilots in jets. And so they took the F-80, stretched it three feet roughly, I think 39 inches, and put an instructor cockpit behind the pilot, pilot seat in the front where the student would fly. And they started training the first generation of uh, jet pilots with this airplane. And they, at Lockheed built them, like, I think 5,000 of them, and then uh, Canada Air Limited, which is now Bombardier, they built like 656 of them under license. Kawasaki built 275 of them under license in Japan. And so fast forward, as I became a pilot and uh, into an aviation career in the military and the airlines, and I got the bug to get into Warbirds, classic military aircraft. Um, had the history with my father, and I just was always very nostalgic about these. So. The way I came about acquiring the airplane is I heard a rumor the Canadian government was holding a surplus auction and they're, they were disposing of these airplanes. And so I did some searching around and got a phone number for a Canadian Air Force public affairs guy. And he said, yeah, hey, we're going we're gonna to have an auction and give us your best bid and you can come up and look at the airplanes in April of 2002. So I did that. Brought a mechanic with me and another pilot friend who knew a lot about this stuff. And uh, sure enough, these airplanes were beautiful. They had just put them through, like four or five years earlier, a complete overhaul and refurbishment. So they were turnkey ready to fly. I didn't have to do any work or restoration on them. And so we combed through the records of about 17 airplanes and figured on the, the probably the top four or five choices and I got my first choice. I just made a sealed bid. It was like price for the price of a new car. Um, but buying it's the cheap part. <laughs> Uh, the airplane burns about five gallons a minute, 300 gallons an hour. <laughs> so, did I mention that buying it's the cheap part? Yeah. Um, so, um, but really simple to operate compared to the um, the old prop airplanes. I mean, the jet's like turning on a ceiling fan, turning it off. Um, and but you have to abide by the numbers, the speeds, the RPM, the engine temperature. Abide by those numbers and watch your fuel because it's going fast. Um, so with my military background, it was it was a pretty easy transition to learn how to fly it. And uh, yeah, so you know instead of having a, an old Harley or a Chris Craft boat, I've got an old military plane. That's it's, it's the same thing. There's a whole community of owners and operators and restoration people, mechanics, and people that have spare parts. And you know it's much like any of those other you know, genres of uh, collectibles. So what year was it built? This was, was built pictured? in 1957 by Canada Limited in, in Cartier, Cartierville, Quebec. And then uh, the Canadian Air Force disposed of it in 2002. That's when I bought it and I've had it ever since. I ferried it home and got it licensed as a U.S. civilian airplane. And How often do you get to fly it? Oh, you know, Living in Wisconsin, you know, spring, summer, and fall, I try to fly it as often as I can, and then winter time, we kind of allocate that for ma for planned maintenance, scheduled inspections, and mm. that sort of thing. So, yeah, I might put 30 or 40 flight hours on it a year, but my average flights are 30 to 40 minutes, so it's a fair number of actual flights, even though the duration's short. So, but yeah, it's a straightforward airplane. It's like a you know, it's like an old Corvette or something. It's it's in, in some ways engineering wise and technology wise it's sort of primitive, but it's but it works great and these were clever guys that designed these things. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thank you, Paul, for that great information.
In 2022, I traveled to Indianapolis IRP for the NHRA National, and we're going to see my old friend, Dennis Ferkus, competing in the Mountain Motor Pro Stock class. First round, Dennis Ferkus in the near lane. He's on the A4 and in domestic parts, alternators and starters. In FR lane, it is Bill Neary. Bill Neary from Burlington, I believe. They line up, Dennis in the near lane, Bill Neary in the far lane. These cars are limited to 825 cubic inches, carbureted, and manual transmissions. They watch the light. Dennis Burkus got the jump. Dennis Burkus goes on to turn a 649.3 at 216 miles per hour. Bill Neary at 658.2 at 216 miles per hour also. This is the matchup everybody's been waiting for. The two fastest qualifiers so far in the far lane. That is John DeFlorian, Jerry Haas Racing. He is second fastest so far. This is the third and final qualifying run. Eliza Morton's in the near lane. He's the fast qualifier so far. John DeFlorian coming off the line first. Turns a 6.30. 0.5. 222 miles per hour. Eliza Morton, 6.33. 221 miles per hour. John DeFlorian is now the fast qualifier. Mountain Motors. NHRA. In the pits, I spotted Angel Sampe, the three-time national drag racing champ. In the pro stock motorcycle classes, we see Angel Sampe pushing her Vance and Hines Suzuki and getting ready. So hey. Tell me about the bike. Oh, uh, she's a, I call her beauty, and she's a beast. What engine? It's the Vance and Hines uh, four-cylinder. Suzuki? Yeah. Basically, four valve. Four valve. Four valve. Good luck, ladies. Be safe. This is it. And Joe, Sam Prey. He came and seen Team Chicago race 20 years ago at No Problem Raceway in Louisiana. I'm here at Indianapolis to see her race 20 years later. She is the fast qualifier. She's up against the second fast qualifier. Matt Smith. They watch the tree. Matt Smith goes 682 at 198. And Jelts, some prey, goes 687 at 196, but she still is the fast qualifier. Earlier, she turned a 679 at 199 miles per hour. So in the qualifying for pro stock motorcycles, she is the fastest. In 2022, I traveled to Elkhorn, Wisconsin for the half mile race, but we're going to jump back to 1987 and listen to the opening by Joe Campbell. Good afternoon, you're going to see the cream of the Middle West on the world's most powerful motorcycles, spine tingling wise by the world's greatest sportsmen. More thin than airplane stunts or any other spectacular sport. Say hi ho, my name is Joe, I come to tell you about our show. We have some racers from far and near who make you stand right up and cheer. I'm going to tell you who they are, how they ride and how they star, what they wear and how they look. Just jot their names down in your 
other book. They're John and Joe and Jim and Jake. What better racers they don't make? The track is fast. The racers, too. Each one wears an iron shoe. From a standing start, they roll away. Each one bound he'll win today. Watch them. Broad slide round those turns. Smell a rubber when it burns. Each machine is tuned to perfection. Stay back from the fence for your own protection. A grander group you'll never meet. During the race, please stay in your seat. Stay off the track while the race is on, or they'll take you home in a basket, son. Anything can happen once we begin, and we're going to begin the races this afternoon with the national anthem. That was Joe Campbell, the voice of motorcycle flat track racing in Wisconsin in the 1960s to the 1980s. And now we're gonna check out the two hooligans, heat races and the finals. Let's see who is the fastest on this half mile in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. And as the green flag flies we're off the line, leading into turn three and four, looks like Ethan Rosine on the Harley Davidson. Second place looks like Blake Berry, and he's on a Honda. 750. This is Hooligans Race. Now, with Hooligans Racing, you have to use a stock engine and a stock frame. That's the requirement to be a Hooligan, and they can run up to 1,200 cc's. Dave Kilkenny, number 35, and he's on the Harley Davidson also. Blake Berry now takes the lead. Second place is Dave Kilkenny. So we got that. 750 Honda, maybe 800 Honda, and right behind him is that Sportster. One lap to go. It's like 35 is taking the lead and going on to pick up the win. First heat race for the Hooligans. Second, Hooligans heat race. And as the flag goes green, they blast off into the first corner. Let me repeat about the Hooligans rule. It's a stock street bike frame and engine. That's what is a hooligan. That's why so many of these riders are riding Harley Davidson Sports. And we see Terry Vestos up front. Second place is like Globe Bronstad. Third place looks like Tony Gorno. Tony Journal is running Pete Pulaski's old Harley Davidson Sportster. As we see the battle continue up front and going on to pick up the win. It is Terry Festo on the Ukes Harley-Davidson. As they blast off the line, Hooligans. Jumping out front, it is a battle between Ethan Rosine and Terry Festo. Down the back, shoot. Terry Festo is up front on that Ukes Harley-Davidson bell helmet. Terry Festo continues the lead. Moving up to second, looks like 35 has now moved to second. It's David Kilkenny. He's from Waukesha, Wisconsin. He's on a Harley Davidson. Third place looks like Roe Bronson, 783. Fourth place looks like Blake Berry on that Honda. He's number 59. Ethan Rosine has dropped back to fifth. Terry Vesta, what a great rider. I've probably been friends with Terry for the last 50 years. Looking great in second place. It is that Dave Kilberry. He looks like he may be able to run down Terry. Third place is Grove Ronstan. The Honda's running fourth place. That's Blake Berry. Putting on a good race though. Number 35. That is Dave Kil Kilkenny. Also on a Harley Davidson. And pick it up to win, Terry Vesto on that Ukes Harley Davidson Redline Cycle and Bell Helmet. What a great race. In 2022, I traveled to Indiana to celebrate with the Kirstings. They were celebrating 60 years as a Harley Davidson and a Yamaha motorcycle dealer. And they brought in a car show and a motorcycle show, and they brought in a couple of stunners on big four Harley Davidsons. Let's check it out.
the Muscle Car and Corvette National Show in Rosemont, I had a chance to talk to a lovely gal who had the first ever Avante produced. Now we're looking at the first ever Avante to roll off the assembly line in South Bend, Indiana in 1963. This is the number one Alvante, and lucky for me, I had the opportunity to talk to Renee Christ. She's the curator of the Auto Museum in Washington, and she's got a great story. Hi, I'm Renee Chris from LeMay America's Car Museum from Tacoma, Washington, and we're here to show Avanti number 1001. It's a car that was donated to the museum uh, over 15 years ago, and we restored it back to its original uh, condition right now. So it's, it's here at the Chicago show to be able to be seen uh, for the first time. And you also said you loaned it to the Studebaker Museum in South Bend? Yeah, it was just come uh, off display at the Studebaker National Museum in South Bend, Indiana, where it was on display for an uh, exhibit of Studebakers, the Avantis, telling the story of the, the Avanti and, and its anniversary. And now you're, going, now you're bringing it back? No, it's going to go home. It's going to go back to Tacoma. Go, going back to Tacoma, it's right. So many people have been coming in wondering where our Avanti is. Right. So it's going to go back. So someone had this car. Yes, it was, it was originally, beat up. actually this is the number one car and we've documented this one as being the car that stayed in South Bend and was, was actually used as their training car for the first year of its life. And after that year it was uh, sent to a dealer in Boston, Massachusetts, where it was originally sold. Went through several owners there. Um, I was able to find the original owner uh, who now who lives in uh, Florida. He came up just this last summer to see the car. But the car has uh, been under a seven-year restoration. It was uh, finished uh, a few years ago, and uh, we, uh, it, was, it was donated to us from a donor who actually bought it on the East Coast, brought it to the West Coast, was going to do the restoration, but it was uh, a little bigger job than he really wanted to do. So this is the authentic interior that Absolutely. came in it? put it back to showroom condition. Right. And the thing that's significant about this is that it's, it's a real uh, effort by the Studebaker community all over the country. Uh, don't make donations to this car, and the Whatcom County Studebaker Drivers Club and the Avani Owners Association all pitched in both with uh, parts and their labor to help us rebuild the car and put it, put it right uh, so just like it's a brand new, just like it was when it was new. Thank you, Renee. What a chance at the Muscle Car and Corvette National Show in Rosemont. I get to see the number one first ever Excalibur and the number one first ever Albante. I have been blessed that I've been able to shoot these great TV shows, race motorcycles, meet some very interesting folks. In the last two years have been just great. Contact me and I love to hear from my audience. It's tdan45 at gmail.com. And remember, you can always search on YouTube with Dan Schmidt Motorcycle Racing for great motorcycle racing action. Dan Schmidt Politics to learn what makes America great. And I highly encourage you to visit the World of Motorcycle Museum. They're in Winnemac, Indiana, four miles south of North Judson on Indiana Highway 39. But give them a call first at 574-896-3172. It's a great trip and a great collection of motorcycles. Pick up your copy of the Team Chicago History Package at Rich's Yamaha in Lockport, Illinois. But give them a call first at 815-838-8130. Their website is richesyamaha.com. Pick up your copy of the Team Chicago History Package.